Simone, you were always there. You were always, always there. Every how and everywhere. Because I found so deep within me. But you will never ever change. Yesterday, today, the same. Forever, till forever, be still. Lift your voice. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We live it all for you. Come on, men, let's join. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living our for you. All together now. the only one, Father. Lord, we thank you that you love us. Like a parent loves their child. Even when they're dirty, even when they're imperfect. Lord, we're messed up as people, but you love us. You are the only one, Jesus, no matter what happens around. You are the one we live for, Jesus. Can we all just lift our hands and sing that part again? You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living not for you. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We live in our for you. Come on, don't be ashamed. Lift your hands. Cause you are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith. This be the anthem of our hearts. One way. 
say, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. Yes, Lord, you are the only one. You're the only one, Jesus.
wants you to pour out your own heart to him. Praise, thanks, questions. He just wants to hear it from you.
your presence. Lord, just let go of who you are. No, sorry, we let go of who we are. And we embrace who you are, Jesus. We let go of our own agenda. We let go of our own ideas, our own will. We just declare your majesty, your kingdom, Father.
worship your holy name. Worship your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless you. We give you praise and honor and glory. Can we just give him an applause this morning? Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. That's the ushers, come on up. Lord, I just thank you for this morning and for this opportunity to just come and and worship you, Lord, and I, I just I just thank you for all your blessings, Lord, and this morning, just as we give back, Lord, I pray that you would um, just bless every hand that gives, Lord God, and, and let it just be to glorify your kingdom and further your kingdom, Lord, and I just, just thank you for always supplying, Lord, all our needs. Amen. So in love with you, my heart is sick. 
seated. Can we welcome up Pastor Ed Kurtz? Let's give him a good welcome. can't see you very good out there. I am very humbled to be here and uh, almost made me cry with that song about blessing the Lord because I have, um, I operate a community center and there's a lot of uh, Chinese children that come and some parents and that is their favorite song. And so we sing that a lot. Oh, I don't like microphones. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm very humbled to be here. I said I would never preach here again. So last time I was down, I didn't. But I was far away, and it was a while ago, so I caved in and said I would. <laughs> so here I am. But I really don't feel worthy to be here. On Friday, I was on the floor of where I stayed. Now, you think I'm very good Christian, and I spend a lot of time on the floor seeking God. But I'm sorry, I was there for exercise. <laughs> I, I realized last time I was down here, the only exercise I had was going from the car to the table. <laughs> that's not enough exercise. That's not good. So I thought I'd get down and do a, pu a couple push-ups, and I succeeded in getting my head off the floor, and that's all. <laughs> so I thought, I'll turn over on my back, and I'll put my feet under the, the sofa, and I'll pull myself up, and I succeeded in getting my head off the floor, and that's it. <laughs> but since uh, I was on the floor, <laughs> I thought I'd stay there a while, and I did, and I... Uh, I had a time with the Lord there. It was interesting. I wasn't expecting it, but I thought about me and God, and I think there's two very important things that we have to do to think about, and one is who God is, and the other is who we are. Very important. It's, it's, it's the most important things in life, who we are, the holy God, and who we are. And some people that I heard about want to change the song Amazing Grace. They want to change that word that saved a wretch like me and make it a little milder. You know what? In my case, ramp it up a couple. Because we are so unworthy. We are in, well, like it says, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian, you're still that way. In our flesh dwelleth no good thing. I think there's a song that says, uh, we're humans and we're ruined by the fall. You know what I mean? We are ruined people. I think Isaiah said it best when he said, woe is me. <laughs> I think that's a good place to start. 
with God. Woe is me. So I soaked there for a while. And, you know, I, I've been thinking of this for years. We call ourselves Jesus sheep. But I think we're more like kid goats. <laughs> you know, the other night uh, at the community center, some guys and I were talking about the Ten Commandments and, 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 and our, you know, how we obey or disobey God. And I, I came to the conclusion we're all needy sinners. I don't care how long we've been Christians. We are needy sinners. And uh, we're, we're more like kid goats than little cute little lambs My, on the farm where I grew up. I don't know how many of you have know what goats act like, but on the farm where I grew up, we had a goat, and it ran around the place, you know, the barn and all that. And one time it ate the wires off the tractor. <laughs> so my dad shoved it in the back seat of the car and said, take it up in the mountains and kick it out. <laughs> so that's what we did. But that's what goats are like. And we, I wish we were nice little lambs, nice little sheep, but I'm afraid we aren't. But anyhow, I, I, I definitely feel called of God, no doubt about that, but I still tremble at the call of God. But thank God, Ephesians 1, 6 says, I am accepted in the beloved. Somebody said that rejection is one of the worst problems for humans. I'm not rejected. I am accepted in the beloved. Another place it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I thank God for his mercy. So I'm glad to be here. Been here as long as Scott and Jolene are married because I came down for that wedding. <laughs> so that's 10 years. That's the first time I came down. And uh, I... I uh, when I first came down, there was a very small congregation here, and there was very much heaviness. We tried to figure it out. Was it the Mayan hangover, <laughs> or was it just religious hangover, or what was it? By the way, on the airplane coming down, there was somebody sitting two seats over, and she had a booklet called Mayan Spiritual Healing. There's going to be trouble. <laughs> that is not the way to go for spiritual healing. So I was down here a year ago at LCI, and I never in my life saw God work as much as he did uh, for two days there. It, it, was, it was wonderful. And I am so happy to go around and talk to people now that were there at LCI, and they say things like, um, God is good, my marriage is healed, this is the best year of my life, I wouldn't have made it without LCI. And you know, the, the Bible talks, the parable of the sower talks about different kinds of ground, good ground, rocky ground, where it springs up real quick and then dies. Well, I thank God that after a year, things are going good, so that must have been on good ground. So... Anyhow, uh, to sum that up, if the Lord would release me, I'd be down here quickly, because I love it here. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8. Did, did anybody preach on the woman with the issue of blood lately? Anyhow, well, that's what we're going to look at today. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. You have Bibles? Well, some of you do. Okay, I'll read it for you. King James. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately the issue of blood staunched or stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. 
And the, when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I'm going to look at uh, Jesus first and what, and his part in this. Um, can you picture it? He was strolling along with a group of people. Um, there's several other places where it talks in the Bible about, uh, in, the, in the Gospels, about Jesus strolling along in a group and people wanting to touch him and be healed. And this is one of those cases where, well, it says in verse 40, the people gladly received him where they were waiting for him. It was a good, jolly occasion. People were happy. And they were, um, you know, in a, in a good mood. And all of a sudden, Jesus stopped. And he turned. And he looked. Something happened. He, he felt it. He felt it in his spirit. I was praying with someone on Thursday. And as we were praying, all of a sudden, something happened. We felt it. There was a release. So this is, must be how Jesus felt there. Um, so he turned around. Verse 45 says, Who touched me? And I, 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 I just love Picture this. The disciples are all around him, and he says, Who touched me? And say, I don't know. Not me. Not me. You know? <laughs> They're all saying, Not me. Wasn't me. So, but um, he, felt, he felt it. So Peter, being bold, said, why do you ask if somebody touched you because there's so many people around you touching you? But it's interesting that if there were a lot of people touching Jesus, only one was healed. It was the one that was expecting to be healed. Do you get that? If people don't expect to be healed, they're not, they're not going to get anything. If I have a friend who's so negative. I'm trying to work with him on this. But he says, well, my friend got delivered the other day, and other people can de get delivered, but I never can. Well, guess what? He won't because he's not expecting to be healed. So uh, the one with the expectation got the blessing. All the rest, I don't know what they were. Maybe they didn't have needs. Maybe they were religious people or something like that. But, okay, you're going to have the question here. In verse 46, Jesus said, somebody touched me because I perceive that virtue went out of me. Now, you're all, you're all going to want to know what virtue is, right? I mean, that's important here. Virtue left Jesus. What is virtue? Well, I looked it up in the Bible, Bible Dictionary, and here are some definitions. Strength, power, abundance, and another definition that I think is interesting, meaning. Now, we can easily see, without a shadow of a doubt, that uh, what came from Jesus was strength and power and abundance and healing. But I like... The, the definition that what came out of Jesus was meaning. We all need meaning in life. Uh, let's see. Uh, without God, if I can remember it right, without God, the sign over there, without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Is that correctly saying what's over there in the office on the wall? Doesn't anybody remember? <laughs> Am I the only one who saw that sign over there? Well, it's something like that. Without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. So uh, if, if what came from Jesus was meaning, it changed the person instantly. I mean, the person can't say, well, it changed this, 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 and this. It changed everything. It just changed your whole outlook toward everything in life. And I think that is neat, that that came from Jesus. Uh, I know my wife one time was delivered from something in our living room, and she said, it seemed like the lights got brighter. You know, another person would say something like, the grass is greener, or the colors are brighter. Instantly, when we get a touch from Jesus, things like that change. 
So virtue out, meaning out of Jesus. Um, I don't know if you ever read Pilgrim's Progress and there's a, the slough of despond or something like that. When you get out, when, when, when you get a touch from Jesus, you get out of the swamp of misery instantly. So now somebody's life has full, is full of meaning. Now, I would imagine that that woman, after the touch from Jesus, would be a firebrand for Jesus. I can just picture her going back to town. She is happy. She is telling everybody about Jesus and what he has done. Uh, I would imagine that on the way home, she either laughed or cried, or being a woman, she probably did both, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, and she would have women's meetings. When she went to the well to get water, she would be bubbling over, you know, encouraging people, helping people. So that was an awesome two or three minutes there when she was touched by God. And Jesus also, I think he felt good about it because he was fulfilled. Now, when... You know, in this, we often think that G she touched Jesus' skin or something. She didn't. She only touched his clothing. You know, it reminds me a little bit about in Acts, where Peter and Paul they would walk by someone and their shadow would heal them, or the demons would come out if they gave them a handkerchief or an apron. Hey, that's getting pretty liberal with goodness, isn't it? That all you have to do is touch the clothing, not the person themselves. So I think with Jesus, when, when the woman touched Jesus in her need, that automatically something came out. Goodness came out of Jesus. Automatically. It's what happens when good people are touched. I have a demonstration here, and I have no idea how it's going to work. But I do need a young lady to come up and help me. About LCI people's age. Then just, okay, it has to be a girl. The reason is that men have no sense of taste. <laughs> you know, my, my wife says, do you taste the oregano in the soup? I don't know what oregano tastes like, so... I don't know, <laughs> you know, and it can't be an older woman because they will be up here for five minutes going, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Trying to taste it? Okay, uh, over here. Whoever moved that did a good job. <laughs> Seriously, I expected, you know, how you swing. It's perfect. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Hope. Uh, stand behind here. Okay, I'm going to bump this. By the way, these cups, they're very small. When I got them, I realized how small they are. One is for my wife, the pretty one, and the other one is, has a map of Belize. That's for Diane, so she can remember. Okay, so watch what I'm doing. And, and this took a lot of practice. Okay, I want you to set, okay, well, I'll set the cup off for you. Okay, now pick up the saucer. Is there a little bit of juice in there or not enough? A little bit, huh? Take the spoon, pour it onto the spoon. Okay. Taste it. I cleaned it all. <laughs> what does it taste like? <laughs> Bitter. Bitter what? Sour limes. Well, it's lemon, I think. <laughs> okay. It's sour. Let me ask you, Hope, why did what was in there 
taste like sour lime or lemon. Why? Because the fruit was bitter. A yes. How did it get, I mean, where did it come from? Where did that juice come from? Um, the cup? Yes. Oh, the cup. Mm. Adam, into the cup. Yes. So, in other words, what is in the cup went out into the saucer, and you tasted it, and it was bitter. Okay. Let's try this one. There you go. Can you do that? She's good at this. Sweet. Sweet what? Tea. T sweet tea. Why did that taste like sweet tea? That's how it was made. That's how it was made. Where did it come from? Out of the cup. Out of the cup. What ended up in the saucer came out of the cup. Thank you. You did a good job. <laughs> Does anybody get the point? How about you when you get bumped? Where do we usually get bumped? <laughs> I would say at home, right? We interact with people pretty much at home. and We often get bumped at home. Uh, sometimes in the workplace, sometimes in the marketplace. Young people, children, do you ever get bumped at school? Um, hopefully when you're driving you don't get bumped <laughs> but some of those almost bumps might bring out what's in your cup <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> I'm sure you do so um, what is in the cup comes out and I would say this too no kidding you know you can't get sweet tea out of a lemon cup <laughs> a cup of lemon juice <laughs> You can't. You cannot get goodness out of a heart that isn't right. You know, sometimes what comes out is often, as humans, anger, maybe impatience, judgment, disgust, criticism, things like that. When actually, when we get bumped, we want people to be healed, loved. One of the things that, one of the words that, that I use a lot lately to describe the goodness of God is warmth. You know, to put it all together in one word, when God ministers to us, our hearts are warmed. Now, this is not the end of the sermon, but I think we ought to pray. Would you pray after me? Heavenly Father... I come to you in Jesus' name. Please make it, Lord, that when I am bumped, goodness comes out of me. Love and warmth for the one who bumped me. Amen. I'm just of the opinion that we need to ask God for what we need. Now let's go to the woman. I don't know how to describe this woman's problem other than it was a messy problem and I don't even like to talk about it. I don't like to, I'm of the old school, I don't like to talk about personal things like that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, okay, well, we'll just, okay. I won't go into detail on that because uh, I could bring up some illustrations, <laughs> but I won't. Okay, she had a massive problem. She was bleeding, and you know where. And it doesn't take much imagination to realize how terrible that must have been. Um, back in those days, there was no store to go to to get pads, you know, uh, if she was married, the Old Testament law said she could have no intimacy with her husband. 
If she wasn't married, there wasn't a chance in the world that she could get married. That's devastating right there for a young woman. You know what I mean? That's, that's the end of the world, so to speak. You know. Um, so her health was shot. And those of you who know a little bit about body chemistry, if she's bleeding a lot, she's probably anemic and white as a sheet because of the loss of blood. Her relationships were cut off. Her finances were shot because she spent all her money on doctors. Her pride and dignity and modesty were way out the window. If you don't believe it, just picture that. I have two men I know of that um, had um, bladder cancer. And both of them said they had to get over going to the doctor's office or the hospital and having nurses come in and check them. <laughs> this woman's been there a lot. And, and uh, you know, and um, the other thing is that it says in here that it was getting worse. You know, it was bad enough. So she was in dire straits. But Jesus said in verse 48, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. So it is faith. He, he commended, commended her on that. And in Mark 5, where it gives the story too, it says, she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. So she had faith to believe that all she had to do was touch him and she would be whole. And like I said before, some people don't receive because they don't believe they can be whole and they're not expecting to be healed. So she touched his clothing and I believe it was a small swipe. It wasn't a, you know, grab on. It was just touched his clothing. And all of a sudden, something happened. Now, in Mark, it says she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And I think the word plague there is interesting, too. Plague is a whole lot worse than I'm sick. <laughs> Plague is a bad thing, <laughs> real bad. You know, they talk about the bubonic plague or the Ebola plague or something like that. It is real bad. She said, I can be healed of that plague. So she felt in her body that she was healed. Now, you, you, you say, how could she feel it so quickly? Verse 44 says, um, immediately the issue of blood staunched or stopped. Well, I'll tell you what. When Jesus does something, you can tell it right away. <laughs> I, I had something in my throat one night, and it was like cutting off my breathing. And I had visions of choking to death, you know, if I ever got my windpipe. I tried swallowing it. It would not go away. My wife put her hand over it and prayed. Just like that, it was gone. Did I know it was gone? Yeah, I knew it was gone. <laughs> uh, one other time, I had pain in my stomach that came from, I, I, um, I worked for some men that uh, didn't like my brand, we'll say, of Christianity, and they criticized me a lot. And on the way, and, and so when I would think of these men, something right about there would go, hmm, twist, and hurt. Then it'd go away, but after a while, it twisted and hurt so much that it hurt all the time. And so one night, I'm going to the meeting with these guys to, to meet with them. And I'm in the car, and I'm singing Amazing Grace, and I'm having a good time. Something, it was like a claw let loose and dropped. Did I know it was gone? I knew it was gone. I haven't had it since, praise the Lord. So I believe that she knew I don't know how, but she knew right away. Then the spotlight turned on her. This is awesome. Jesus looked at her. The crowd looked at her. She was the center of attention. And then it says in verse 47, some of the most amazing words that I can think of. Verse 47, it says, 
she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him. Would you have wanted to do that? Spill the beans like that of what was wrong with her? She told it all, all the, just what I told you a few minutes ago. She said it all to the men, to Jesus, to the women, whoever was there. She said it all. I can't believe that. I think I'd have been tongue-tied. <laughs> that would have been me. I think I'd have beat around the bush. <laughs> you know, I think I'd have made it, covered, at least glossed something over. <laughs> but every, everybody heard it. But you know what? Listen to me. When we get touched by Jesus, our pride is gone. No pride when you get touched by Jesus. None of the shame is there either. I'm getting chills thinking about it. No shame when we get touched by Jesus. Everything's in the light now. The virtue from the greatest healer in the world touched her. What has she got to lose? Tell everything. You know, I think sometimes, no, I not think, I know. Sometimes we have false modesty. You know, we have spiritual pride. And all that stuff from the, what should I say, former generations. I grew up a little Mennonite farm boy. I grew up in a Mennonite I know how that is. Don't ask about their finances. You'll never get an answer. <laughs> they'll never tell you about their finances. Uh, they'll never tell you about the skeletons in the closet and their ancestors. They'll never tell you about the sexual things that went on in a, you know, past. They'll never talk about the Ouija board they had in their room. They'll never talk about the demonic stuff. They'll never talk about the incest in the family or something like that. They'll, and if they do tell you something, they'll tell you the side that they want you to hear, but they won't tell you the whole story. Do you, do you know what I mean? That, that's, that is the pride of people who haven't been touched by Jesus. Because that stuff is open when you touch Jesus. But I think the reason that she was so humble is that she was desperate. You know, sometimes when we get desperate for God and the things of God, we act differently than if we're just coming in half-heartedly. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. Who in the world wants to confess your faults to somebody else? But if you do, you can be healed. Pray one for another that you may be healed. First John says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So what made her so different was that she was touched by the Lord Jesus. I heard another good illustration of the same thing at LCI and one of the speakers said that Moses and the Israelites went out of Egypt. Moses had come from a, the most wealthy home in Egypt and he came out into the desert. The others who came out were slaves and they came out. So here's Moses and the people. The people several times said, take us back to Egypt. Like, where is your head? You were in slavery. You want to go back to slavery? But Moses never wanted to go back. Do you know why? He met God on the mountain. That made all the difference in the world. So um, the other Wednesday, we had a meeting, and there was a young man that was set free from a demon, maybe more than one. And I think it was the next day he called me. He said, I was at my, with my friend. And, and they, some, those guys sometimes use pretty bad language <laughs> at, toward each other and all that stuff. And he said, we were working on getting a car part. And I called my friend stupid. <laughs> and he said, but I apologized. That's a touch of Jesus. 
I used to be a school teacher. And one time a girl called me and said, Mr. Kurtz, I stole a piece of chalk. That's a touch of Jesus. Another guy called and said, I used to go down the steps where there was a light bulb, and I used to snap it. <laughs> of course, the next day it was burned out. He said, where should I send the money? <laughs> That's a touch of Jesus. It's humility that these things happen. Uh, let me just read a little bit here from Philippians 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Well, I'll admit, some of these verses that say things like that, I feel pretty... Will I ever get to the place where I esteem others better than myself? That's, that's a goal. I don't see how I'll ever make it. <laughs> but that's what the Bible says. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Revelation 12.10 says something about the devil being the accuser of the brethren. Is that the direct quote? Does anybody know? The devil is the accuser of the brethren. I looked it up. It says, the accuser of our brethren. That, that's a big difference. The accuser of our brethren. That's why it's important when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. It brings a unity, a connectedness. Uh, in my teaching about spiritual warfare, I'll say, if there's a voice in your head and it says you, that's the demon talking to you because it's, it's not you. If you talk about yourself, you say I. If, if a, somebody else is talking to you, they say you. And if a demon is talking to you, it says you. But I heard something the other day that I thought was so good. The person was having business problems and the Lord said, there is nothing here that we can't deal with. We, me and God, whoa, that is, that's an awesome statement. That would only come from God, <laughs> but I, I love that. So anyhow, the word devil in the Greek is diabolus, which means to divide between. And I'll tell you what, I don't want to be on his side. One of the things I'd like to say here this morning is that we need to give each other a break Give me a break. I am finding so much lately how I need a break. <laughs> One time, um, at Christmas time, I thought, I am going to get all my family presents. Oh, I was so happy. I thought it was a good, good idea from God that I get presents for everybody. So I put my wallet in my pocket. And I went to the store. I got one of these uh, shopping carts. It was like Santa's sleigh and I was throwing stuff in. <laughs> and I took it home. Nobody liked what I, what I got. <laughs> I said, oh. You know, and then I thought about God who gave the best gift and nobody likes his either. I mean, very few people. Think of the people of the world and how few people like the best gift that was ever given. So who am I as a human to do that? The other day I was uh, at the local Walmart and there was an old man helping his old wife into the car and the grocery cart was sitting there. And so I wanted to say something to him, but he was busy. So I just took the grocery cart and pushed it toward the door. He comes running after me and he says, her cane's in there. <laughs> Can't I win? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to do good, but you know, uh, I, I find that so much. And I find that, that there's so much misunderstanding. Uh, you know, my wife is getting a little hard of hearing. And I say, um, could, did you um, put the trash in the box? And she said, what'd you say? Should I put the cash on the rocks? <laughs> <laughs> Give her a break. <laughs> in fact, there's an article in the paper uh, about this older woman who said she and her friends got together and they realized that they're hard of hearing so they can't hear the bad stuff. They're, they're, they can't see stuff like they used to. So, you know, 
little dirt on the floor doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> and she said, you know, hang loose. You know, uh, someone has said, maybe you all heard it, that people with Alzheimer's, what is it, uh, easy to forget problems, <laughs> you know, they don't hold grudges. Do we all need to get old before we hang loose a little bit? Let's see, where's Brother David? He was here. Okay, he spoke in, um, uh, at LCI one evening, and he was talking about the, um, uh, remember when Elijah, the, the city was surrounded, and the, the servant was very concerned. And so Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see what is around there. And so the servant looked and wow, he said, the chariots of fire and of God, they are much more than the American troops. <laughs> well, I went over and beat him up. <laughs> What's he doing saying that against my country? <laughs> It's really Assyrian troops, and he did say Assyrian. <laughs> but the point is, we can misunderstand and get so bent out of shape. Relax, folks. I know his, there he is. I know his heart. And even if he would say that, I know his heart. Not just the words that he said, you know. So we have to make a lot. In fact, in the Living Bible, in the book of James, it says, make allowances for each other's faults. Wow. Ephesians 4 said, says, in lowliness and meekness, mm, love, something about love. <laughs> okay. I am, I am talking to you, but the answer is not my talking. The answer is Jesus talking to you. So I want to give you a formula that I have found. Now, I hate formulas, so you can put it in your own words. <laughs> But it's something like this. And we're going to do it first with um, asking the Lord, the Lord Jesus, what he thinks of you. Now, this is not my total point here this morning, but I want you to know that he tells people what he thinks of them. You know, my sheep hear my voice type thing? I have done this many times, and many people have been blessed. So... Here it is. Now, when you ask God a question, expect an answer almost before you get done with the question. Because he's not far away. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think God's way up there. And <laughs> used to be when they, they'd have these uh, interviews from Iraq, there was like a two or three second delay because they had to go up to a satellite and back down. It's not that way with Christians. He's right here, so expect an answer. So uh, this is not my first point, but we're going to do it anyhow. This is the formula. Pray after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Some people don't like me, but Lord Jesus, please tell me what you think of me. I'll, I'll, out of curiosity, I'll just ask, did anybody hear anything? Did anybody hear what Jesus said? Did anybody hear what Jesus thinks of you? I, uh, I, I tell you what, if you didn't, uh, don't worry about it. You're in a crowd of people. <laughs> you know, if you wonder, go home tonight when it's all quiet and ask that question, if you're still wondering. But then you can ask him about other things, too. Did you know that? Can, you can ask him about the situation that you're in. You know, Lord Jesus, I don't know what to do in this situation. I need help. Please tell me. Now, I'm a stickler, as you that we're here, know that we're here a year ago. I'm a stickler on asking the Heavenly Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Anybody remember that? You don't remember that? <laughs> I tried to demonstrate that last year on a Thursday night. Ask the Lord Jesus. Ask what he wants. Okay. We're going to have a test after soon. 
But uh, I want to read something here that I, to me, I need every now and then. When you are forgotten or neglected and purposely set aside and you don't sting and hurt with the insult or the oversight, but your heart is happy being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. I remember my son telling me one time, we as Christians are called to die. A little painful, but it is painful, really. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even defend yourself, but take it all in patient, loving silence, that is dying to self. I don't know if you ever heard the illustration of the child who was standing up in the high chair and the parent made him sit down, but the child said, I'm still standing up inside. I think that's too much our problem. You know, we can say, oh, that's okay, that's okay, but inside we're boiling, <laughs> wanting to get revenge or something like that. When you can see your brother prosper and have his needs met and can honestly rejoice with him in spirit and feel no envy nor question God while your own needs are far greater and in desperate circumstances, that is dying to self. When you can receive correction and reproof from one of less stature than yourself and can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment rising up within your heart, that is dying to self. And I'd like to read this last paragraph. It says, are you dead yet? In these last days, beginning to believe that more and more in these last days, <laughs> the spirit would bring us to the cross that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Did you get a touch of Jesus? Did you touch him? Did he touch you? Okay, so now it's test time. Here's the test. Are you saved? The test is 1 John 3.14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's the test. Uh, hey, that's biblical. <laughs> that's not me. And another one. Are you a disciple of Jesus? John 13.35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So the big test is whether we have love. Uh, do we need prayer? Maybe we should. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we are needy people. We are ruined by the fall. And unless we touch you and you touch us and virtue and meaning flows out of you, we're sunk. And we're not talking about just in church on Sunday or once in a while during the day. We're talking about a life filled with virtue and love and warmth and healing that flows out of other, uh, flows from us to others. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.